Welcome you to the Math Associates Seminar. And our speaker today is Carolina Araujo from INFA. And she's speaking uh, on symmetries in algebraic, in algebraic geometry and the cremonology. Okay, thank you. <coughs> um, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, the ICTP math section for running this, uh, this seminar and for inviting me to give this talk. And also I would like to thank uh, all of you who came to the seminar. So the topic of my talk is uh, symmetries in, in algebraic geometry. So as usual, when you were studying some object in mathematics, you would like to understand its, uh, its symmetries. And in our case, we are studying uh, complex projective varieties. And, uh, and, and the first more natural notion of symmetry in this case is just uh, the notion of automorphism. So let me just uh, remind you what this is. So we are, in general, if you have two um, projective varieties, X and Y, uh, we have a notion of morphism this, between these varieties. So this is just a, a functional a, a map that is um, it's locally given, given by, uh, by polynomials. So this also leads to the notion of um, automorphism and the automorphisms of a fixed complex projective variety, they form, they form a group, which we denote by uh, the automorphism group of X. So for example, uh, maybe the simplest example is the case when X is the projective space, then the automorphism group is just the, the the group of PGLN plus one C. So these are just represented by invertible matrices of uh, size N plus one. Uh, in general, the structure of the algebraic, of the automorphism group of a projective variety actually tells us something about the variety itself. So in general, if you have a complex projective variety, then the automorphism group has a structure of a Lie group. And then we can look at the connected component of the identity, and, and this is actually a complex algebraic group. So that is to say, it has a structure of a uh, algeb complex uh, algebraic variety, and the group structure is, uh, the, meaning the multiplication and the inverse are, these operations are morphisms in the category of uh, algebraic varieties. So let us look at some examples. So let's suppose that we start with our, our variety X is just a smooth projective curve of genus G. So we know that there is this, uh, this well-known classification this, this, um, by, by in terms of the genus. So we have this trichotomy of genus zero, uh, genus one, and genus greater or equal than two corresponding to the uh, types of the signs of the, the curvature. And, and and, and the interesting thing is that the automorphism group of X actually reflects the geometry of the, of the variety. So for instance, for this trichotomy, uh, we have very different behaviors of the automorphism group. So in the case of genus zero, so this is just the automorphism group of P1, so this is PGL2. Um, in the case of genus one, so this is an elliptic curve and it has a structure of, uh, it has a, it has an, a group structure. And then uh, with this group, group structure, then this connected component of the identity is just isomorphic to X itself. And for genus greater or equal than two, then the automorphism group is, uh, is finite. Actually, we even know a bound for the, for the order that depends linearly on the, on the genus. So what I want, to, want you to get from this slide is that the automorphism group um, actually reflects this, this trichotomy. So we have three very different behaviors. So the first two, genus zero and one, even though they're both complex algebraic groups, notice that the first one is, uh, is a linear group. So this is an affine group. While the second one, genus one, this is a projective, um, it's a project group, it's a, it's, um, a billion variety. So this, uh, in general, in higher dimensions, the automorphism group will have a mixed behavior. So it will be a combination of these three uh, types of groups. So this can be made uh, very, um, um, 
explicit by you know looking at some exact sequences but i would not uh, want to do this what i would like to do next is to argue that for certain purposes in algebraic geometry uh, the automorph automorphisms are too too rigid and this should not be the right types of uh, symmetry that we should look at so let me argue by um, introducing the classification problem in algebraic geometry so in uh, we we so we are in dimension one this classification problem is uh, is very easy it was accomplished uh, basically by Riemann so what we want to do in this case is to classify say smooth projective curves um, in, uh, <clears throat> classify by um, uh, modulo isomorphism. So modulo isomorphism, we have, we first classify them by the genus. And if you fix the genus, which is a, which is a discrete invariant, then for each G, you have a moduli space of curves of genus G. So this is, a, is an algebraic variety. And each point of this algebraic variety will correspond uh, exactly to a one uh, curve of a smooth projective curve of genus G. So this is a this is a very um, a very um, nice uh, classification. But if we move to higher dimensions, then uh, I will try to explain to you that this is not is no longer possible. So there are way too many isomorphism classes. And you cannot expect to have a nice classification as in the case of curves. So let me, uh, let me um, illustrate this by um, explaining a, a very basic uh, construction in algebraic geometry, namely uh, the, the blow up of, um, of a projective variety. I will explain this to, uh, in the case of P2. And, um, and then I will say what, what happens in general. So in the case of Pichu, so I have this, I found this a uh, very nice uh, picture of the blow up of Pichu that I want to share with you. So this is, um, uh, this is by uh, Stats. Uh, he, he made the code available in tech, so you can also use it if you want. So this is what we want to do. So you start with a Pichu and you take a point in Pichu and you would like to construct um, another surface that uh, looks like P2 outside this point, and you want to replace this point by a P1 corresponding to the tangent directions at that point. So this is uh, what, what the picture should look like. And if you want to construct it, let me just give you a formal construction of the blow up of P2. So we, uh, we take, for instance, this point of, uh, with um, projective coordinate 0, 0, 1, and you consider uh, this map, so this is this map here in blue, the projection from the point P. So this is projects from the point P to another line that does not contain P. So in terms of coordinates, it can be given in this, uh, in this way. Um, and notice that this, this map is, is, not, is not defined precisely at the point P. Now, if we consider the graph of this map inside, so you remove the point and you consider the graph inside P2 cross P1, and then you take the closure, then what you get is precisely what I'm calling X tilde, which is how I define the blow up of P2 at the point. So you see, it's easy to see that outside the point P in P2, uh, this is just an isomorphism and the, and and the inverse image of P will correspond exactly to the P1 of tangent directions uh, at this point. So uh, notice, so let me just uh, say here, so this is what I just said. So if you remove this, this exceptional P1, so we usually call it exceptional, um, exceptional curve, this exceptional P1, and you remove the point P, then you have an isomorphism between this, um, uh, this open subsets. So E here is just the exceptional P1. And so this is going to be a very important uh, notion that we are going to generalize. Let me just observe, this is going to be also useful later on, that once you take this, uh, you define this blow up, if you look at the second projection to P1, this will give a structure of a P1 bundle over P1 on the blow up. 
okay, so this is the blow up of P2, but in general, you can, um, you can de I defined it in a very concrete way, but you can define it in, a, in an intrinsic way. And then in this way, you can blow up any protective variety at, a, at any point P. And, and even more generally, you can blow up uh, any protective variety along a proper subvariety. Um, and so in this case, you will replace each point of the subvariety Z by the, the, the normal directions at, uh, at, of Z on X at this point. And so the important thing here is that exactly as before, you define a, a, um, a map that it's, so it's not defined everywhere. I mean, in this case, the, the, the blow up is, the, the map of the, the blow up is defined everywhere, but it's an isomorphous once you remove this exceptional set and the center of the blow up. Okay, so, um, so notice that in, in this way, we can construct infinitely many uh, varieties that are, that look like P2, so they have some dense open subset that are isomorphic to P2, but they are going to be different than P2. So it's, it's easy to see that the blow up is not isomorphic to P2 because the second Betty number, whenever we blow up, the second Betty number uh, increases by, uh, by one. Okay, so in this way, we can construct very many, um, many surfaces or in general, many varieties that look like uh, a given variety in some open subset. And let me just point out why here we had to start with dimension two and blow up a point. So if we had just a curve, if we try to do the same thing with a curve, if we blow up the point, we replace this point by the tangent directions at this point, but there's only one tangent direction. So we actually, you don't change the, the, the curve if you blow up a smooth point. Okay, so now, now it comes, so now I, I, I hope I, I motivated you to define this notion of uh, birational equivalence. So two projective varieties, X and Y, are said to be birationally equivalent if I can find two dense open subsets, U and V, and an isomorphism between them. So in general, I will denote this, um, this, this a birational equivalence or a birational map in, in this way. And, and here, um, the way we should look at this is that we, we, this is a map that is locally defined by quotients of polynomials. So we are allowing for, for poles, and so that's why it's not defined everywhere. Okay, so uh, now that I have introduced um, uh, so I, this is the, the notion of birational equivalence. Let me just point out that we can characterize it in a purely algebraic way. So this notion is equivalent to asking that the group, that the uh, function field of X and Y are isomorphic over C. So the function field of a variety is just the, the field of functions that are, so these, the functions are functions to, to C, um, neuromorphic functions to C, so they are locally defined by quotient of two polynomials. Okay, so now the problem, the classification problem in, 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 in algebraic geometry in higher dimension becomes the following. So if you are given um, a projective variety X, so the first task is to find a simplest representative in its birational class. So for instance, in the case when we start with P2 and start blowing up uh, P2 at many points, um, clearly a simplest representative is the, is the P2 itself. So this is, uh, for this talk, I will call this just a minimal model of, of X. And let me just point out that in general, there is not only one simplest representative, there will be uh, some, some simplest representative in, in, in a given class. But we would like at least to find, to define a notion of simplest representative and be able to find this representative. And once we have accomplished this, the second step would be to, to construct modelized spaces of minimal models. Of course, you have for that, you have to fix some um, discrete invariants and then hope to have a again, this, this uh, space of models to have some uh, structure of algebraic variety. So this is roughly the classification problem 
in higher dimension algebra geometry. And let me concentrate on the first, uh, on the first step. So you are given a projective variety and you want to find the simplest representative in its birational class. So this is accomplished by the minimal model program. So the minimal model program, and let me just give a quick overview, historical overview. So in dimension one, this is the classification of Riemann surfaces that I have already explained. In dimension two, so this is the case of surfaces, then this was uh, developed, this was accom accomplished by the Italian school by the by early, early uh, 20th century. So in the case of surfaces, the situation is very simple. So uh, all, the, all the operations that you have to do are the blow-ups that I explained. So you start with a with a surface and then you, you ask if it is the blow up of another surface. So if it is, then you just contract that exceptional P1 and look at the new surface. So when you do this, the, the second batting number will always decrease and eventually you reach uh, your minimal surface. So this was done by the Italian school in the, in the early 20th century. In higher dimension, this, uh, the situation is much harder. So in dimension, Three, it was accomplished by uh, Mori in, in 1988, and this is actually what uh, gave him the, the Fields Medal in 1990. And in higher dimensions, this was accomplished by Birkar, Caccini, Haken, McKernan, or almost accomplished. Um, and, uh, and, and so this, are, this became a very strong techniques that we use in higher dimension algebraic geometry. And, and let me just, just say a few few differences from the, the surface case. So the first difference is that, um, so there are more operations than, uh, more general than blow up. So you have to allow for other, um, other operations, birational operations among algebraic varieties if you want to get to a, a minimal model. And also one very important thing is that, um, and maybe this is why it took so long to, 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 to develop the theory, from dimension two to dimension three, is that we ha people had to accept that we have to deal with singularities. So you cannot have a minimal model program if you do not allow for some singularities. And so part of the test is to try to identify what is the correct um, notion of singularity that you should allow to still have the, the, um, the theorems that you want and, and to be able to run the program. So maybe I do not want to spend so much time in that. But now, once we have the minimal model program, then um, we can now concentrate on special birational classes. So let me uh, define, give you an important definition, uh, the notion of rationality. So a projective variety is rational if it is birationally equivalent to a projective space. So this is, just, this is the same as saying that it's in, algebraically that it's function field is isomorphic over C to a purely transcendental um, extension of C. So this is, um, so this is the notion of um, rationality. And so, um, and some of the problems that are currently very being very much studied are, so which algebraic varieties are rational? So this, this problem has been receiving a lot of attention and we have been witnessing great developments uh, in, this, uh, in this theory, this uh, rationality problem. And, uh, and then related to that, if you want to prove or disprove that a certain variety is rational, it's useful to have some, some invariants that uh, detect rationality. So which properties are invariant under birational equivalent? So let me first concentrate on the first, on the first problem just giving you a few examples, and then I will start to discuss some birational uh, invariants. So this problem is open even for the simplest type of projective varieties that are hypersurfaces. So these are uh, varieties that are defined by a single um, polynomial equation. So you fix D, the degree of this polynomial, and N, the dimension of the variety, and you want to know if the generic hypersurface of degree D is rational or not. So if the, if the degree is very large, then it's easy to see that the, the hypersurface is irrational just by computing some, um, some, cohomo com some cohomology groups which are invariant under uh, birational equivalent. So the difficulty becomes for a small degree. So let me just give you uh, a very uh, classical example when the answer is yes. 
it, uh, the answer is uh, rationality. So this is the example of a quadric hypersurface. So if you start with a quadric hypersurface in, um, in projective space, then you can always project from a point. So this is the stereographic projection. So if you project from this point, um, because your hypersurface has the Greek chu, so any line joining, um, any line that is uh, secant, properly secant to this uh, hypersurface, we will cut it in two points. So the projection, if you remove this point from which you are projecting, and if you remove uh, all the lines passing through this point that are contained in the hypersurface, then you get a one-to-one -one map uh, into the into its image in a, in a, in a hyperplane. So this gives a, a birational map between uh, a quadric hypersurface and and uh, Pn. Sorry, here it, I should have here Pn instead of uh, Pn plus one. Sorry for that uh, typo. Okay. So this is the case for uh, degree two, but uh, I, would, I, I would like to point out that already for degree three, this, uh, this question is, this problem is open. So is, is, if the dimension of the hypersurface is at least four, then it is not known if a generic cubic hypersurface is rational or not. So it's, a, it's almost unbelievable that we still cannot answer this, uh, this very simple question. So for, surf, for a cubic surface is rational. A cubic threefold is, is not rational by the work of Clemens and Griffiths. And, and already in dimension uh, four, uh, we do not know. And so now let me start this, this discussing uh, the second problem that I posed. So how can we detect rationality or irrationality. So which properties are invariant under birational equivalence? And now I would like to go back and talk about symmetries of projective varieties. So, um, so the first observation is that the automorphism group is not good if you want to detect uh, birational um, equivalence. So if you have an automorphism of X and you have a Birational equivalence, a birational map from X to Y, then if you compose, in general, you will not get an isomorphism of Y. You will only get a birational self map of Y. And so this is why uh, the automorphism group is not a birational equivalence. And actually, this leads us to uh, define this, uh, this new notion of symmetry that is more useful in this context, which is the notion of. Um, birational self map. So if you, uh, the, the, what I call the birational group of a variety is just going to be the group under composition of a birational self map of, uh, of X. So this is an isomorphism between uh, dense open subsets of X, which do not necessarily extend to the whole space. So in particular, and now I introduce the, so the main topic of this, uh, this talk, which is the Cremona group. So the Cremona group in dimension N is just a group of birational self maps of the projective space of dimension N. So the, the, uh, the Cremona group includes, of course, the automorphism group of PN. So this uh, PGLN is, uh, is contained here, uh, but it has many more elements. So in fact, let me just describe you the simplest one, which is, uh, which we call the standard quadratic transformation. So let me define it in, in, um, in projective coordinates. So I can define it in two ways. So I can just take the fine start by defining it as uh, in projective coordinates, just by, by taking the inverse of the, of the coordinates X, Y, and Z. So this uh, representation is uh, good to see that actually tau is going to be an involution. But if you prefer, if you are bothered by this, uh, this denominators here, so you can multiply everything by x, y, z, and then you get this, this quadratic uh, representation of the, sorry, of the um, standard uh, Cremona transformation. So from this representation, we see that actually this, uh, this map is not an automorphism. So I have this uh, picture here to try to illustrate 
uh, what it does. So outside, so these are these three lines in colors here are the, um, are the coordinate lines. And so the Cremona group, we can see that outside this uh, three lines, it is just an isomorphism of the complement of the of the of the complement of these three lines, which we, we call the torus. So it outside the, the three lines, outside this triangle, this is just an automorphism of the torus. But what it does to these three lines, so it it contracts each one of these lines uh, to a coordinate point. And so it is not really, it's not an isomorphism. Okay, so um, so now um, what so this uh, so this is this is an element of order of order two, so by uh, um, a degree two, so by the degree of uh, a birational uh, uh, by rational self map of PN, I just mean the so I can always represent it as a uh, in coordinates by by polynomials, uh, homogeneous polynomials of the same degree without common components. So this degree in this case here is true, but one can actually show that you can have you have uh, um, by rational self maps of PN of R or in, in particular of P2 of arbitrary uh, degree. However, uh, which is uh, something a classical theorem says that the whole uh, Cremona group in dimension two is generated by the automorphism group of P2 and this one standard quadratic transformation. So you add this tau that I just described and then you get the whole, uh, the whole Cremona group. So this may look, uh, so if you look at the representation like this, you may think that this is actually very easy to describe this group, you know, because you have this such nice, um, the automorphism group is a PGL3, it's very well understood, and then you add this one involution, but then it turns out that this group becomes extremely complicated. And so there are, so it's, it's, it's you know, it was introduced more than a hundred years ago, and still people, there is a lot of um, work being done to understand this group, and only very recently we have been able to answer some, some very basic question about this group. So, for instance, only in 2010, um, Kanta and Lamy uh, proved that uh, this Cremona group in dimension two is not a simple group. So they produced uh, normal subgroups of this group. And you see this is, a, this is very recent and also very recent, only very recently we have um, been able to obtain a, a complete classification of the finite subgroups of, uh, of the Cremona group in dimension two. So this is a, a work of a lot of people. So it started with the work of uh, Bertini in, uh, in the, the 19th century, and it was only finished by recently by Dolgachev and Skovsky. And, and, and so this is to show that this is actually a complicated group um, to study. And this is only for dimension two. And now if you move to higher dimensions, if you are interested in the Cremona group in higher dimensions, then the, comp the situation is much more complicated. So, uh, so Ilda Hudson proved back in 1927 that in starting in dimension three, the Cremona group cannot be generated by elements of bounded degree. So this is very different from the dimension two case. So the dimension two, the automorphisms are linear, so they have degree uh, one, and the, the, the standard quadratic has the degree two, and they generate the whole group. And so we cannot have such nice uh, description in terms of generators. So they cannot be generated by elements of uh, bounded degree in this sense. And so then a natural problem um, is to construct, since we cannot have a full description of this group, we would like to in construct interesting subgroups of, um, of the biration of the Cremona group in dimension n. So what do I mean by interesting? So first of all, we would like to, we would like it to have some nice um, group structure, something that we can actually describe. But also, of course, we would like this, this group should correspond to symmetries that have some, some nice uh, geometric property. For instance, they should uh, preserve some extra structure on the, on the projective space. So let me give you an example of uh, such a uh, special subgroup. 
So this, uh, let me describe, this is still in dimension two. Let me desc describe the symplectic um, birational transformation. So if we fix here, I'm writing this in a fine coordinates X and Y. I will write this, this meromorphic volume form uh, on P2 and it has simple poles, sorry, I forgot to write something here. It has uh, simple poles exactly along this, this triangle, the three coordinate uh, lines. And we would like to describe uh, this subgroup of um, birational self maps of P2 that preserve this meromorphic volume form. So this was done by Blanc in 2013. So he gave this, um, this nice description of this, uh, this, this special subgroup. So, so it is uh, generated by um, SL2Z and uh, C star. Um, square. So this is the, these are automorphisms of the, the, the torus um, C star square. And this is just another, this is just one element, one um, element of order five. And <clears throat> so let me just explain here in blue, so the SL2Z acts on, on P2 by this, uh, by monomial maps of this type. So for instance, here we do see the standard Cremona, for instance. Okay, so now, uh, so this is a, it's a, it's a nice group. So actually Blanc also gives uh, some of the rela relations in, in this group. And we would like, uh, for instance, one problem is to determine the, the corresponding, the analogous group in higher dimension. So we have this natural volume, uh, meromorphic volume form in PN, which poles exactly along the, the coordinate hyperplanes. And we would like to determine the, the group of birational self maps that preserve this uh, meromorphic volume form. So we do not know how to answer this, although our techniques uh, do apply in this case. So, um, so let me uh, generalize this problem uh, a little bit more. So instead of looking at the, uh, of, of, at that volume form that has poles exactly along the, along the coordinate hyperplanes, let me um, take any meromorphic volume form in PN. So if you fix a meromorphic volume form, again, you can look at the birational self maps of PN that preserve this volume form. Now, I will associate to a volume form, neuromorphic volume form, I would like, I will associate something in the uh, second cohomology group of, uh, of PN. So this is just taking the divisor corresponding to the, this neuromorphic volume form. So what does that mean? So the divisor of the, of the form <clears throat> is just the divisor of zero. So these are just uh, correspond to the, uh, the hypersurfaces where this form vanishes taken with the appropriate multiplicities minus uh, this, the, the sum of the um, hypersurfaces where it has poles taken with the appropriate uh, multiplicities. So this, okay, so this is, a, this is, just, this is just, just a formal linear combination of, um, of hypersurfaces. And, um, but it, of course it defines an element in the cohomology group and in this cohomology group, this is always uh, <clears throat> equivalent to this uh, minus n plus one times a hyperplane section. So, and conversely, if you have any hypersurface of degree n plus one in Pn, then you can find uh, a unique form up to scaling, a unique meromorphic form, which is nowhere vanishing, and it has poles exactly along this hypersurface. So this is what I mean by this. And now, the, uh, so given this, I will just change my notation here. So given the hypersurface, I will denote by this, this uh, subgroup of the Cremona group, by rational self maps, uh, volume preserving D to be the self of the, the group of by rational self maps of PN that preserve the corresponding volume form. And now the problem then becomes, uh, if you give me a hypersurface, to determine this, um, this subgroup of the Cremona group. So I have been um, 
investigating this problem in a joint problem in a joint project with Alessio Corte and Alex Massarenti. And so I would like now to discuss uh, some, some recent results that we have obtained. Uh, so by the way, I, we, I, we worked this out um, in my last visit as an associate to ICTP, so I, I thank ICTP for that. So if you, um, so now given the problem is given a hypersurface of degree n plus one in Pn, then first determine the uh, group of birational self maps of Pn that preserve the corresponding volume form. So the first result that we have is the following. So if you take the, the hypersurface D to be very general, then you don't get anything interesting. So by ver very general, I mean that D is a smooth hypersurface and, and by the Lefschetz uh, principle, the uh, second cohomology group of D is induced by that of the projective space. So this, is the, this happens for a very general um, hypersurface. So in this case, the group of birational self maps of Pn preserving the, the corresponding volume form is nothing but the automorphism group of Pn that preserve the hypersurface D. So you don't get anything interesting. So you cannot, so this, this hypersurface has to have some sort of degeneration in order to give you something interesting. On the other hand, if you allow for uh, to degenerate hypersurface, then uh, uh, you do get something, you may get something interesting, but it, it's maybe very hard to describe. So for instance, if you concentrate all your poles in one hyperplane, say at the hyperplane at infinity, this will contain, this group will contain uh, as a subgroup, the group of um, automorphism of the affine space. And this is known to be a very complicated group. So you have, for instance, the Jacobian conjecture that tells us what these elements should be. And, and so this is, uh, this is this, in this two degenerate cases, actually our techniques will not be able to, to handle. So the idea is to take something in between we would like to uh, consider hypersurfaces which are singular but the singularities are mild and then in this case we hope to use the techniques from the minimal model program to determine this uh, this special subgroup so by mild here for those that are familiar with the um the, the notions of singularities from the minimal model program this is just that we ask that the pair P, N, and D has log canonical uh, singularities. Okay, so now let me describe uh, our, our first interesting uh, subgroup. So this is going to be in P3, and we are going to take a general quartic hypersurface with one singular point. Um, and so if you want to see the, the explicit equation of one such uh, quartic hypersurface, it would be like this. So here, um, so we take the point P to be the point with the projective coordinates one, zero, 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 and then the equation of the quartic is given by this form here. So we see that it has a, um, at, at the point P, it will have a singularity that locally looks like the vertex of a quadric cone. So this is how the singularity looks like. And in this case, the first thing that I want to show you is that we do get new uh, non-automorphisms non in this special birational subgroup. So for instance, I gave you just a very explicit one. So here, um, so here, this is a rational map. Then you, if you want, if you sit down, you compute that it preserves the volume form associated to D. Let me point out that in this case, when you have such nice singularity, the, the, the condition that it preserves the volume form in this case is, is equivalent to say that it restricts to um, a birational self map of D. So this is not true in general for arbitrary D, but for, for this D, uh, checking that it preserves the volume form is equivalent to check that in, it restricts to a birational self map of D. And so, um, and so here is, uh, if, if you plug in the equation of D, you will see that it preserves D, it induces a birational self map of D. Also, it is an involution. And you see 
the, this, uh, so from the equation here, the A is the equation of this, this A in green here that appears here, is just the equa equation of the tangent cone at that singular point. And you see that this cone here in P3 is contracted to a point under this uh, birational map. So this is really not, not a, uh, an automorphism. It is uh, defined um, at this, uh, uh, at a general point of the cone and it contracts the cone to a point. Okay, so this, uh, so this is to show that we get something new. And as I said, this is a, this is a, this phi is a, is an involution. So you can, this is something you can also compute. And, and we actually, uh, our next, in our next result, we actually compute this, this um, by the subgroup of the birational, the Cremona group of P3 that uh, preserves the volume form. And this is going to be a semi-direct product of um, this cyclic group of order two. So this part here is just this, uh, this group that I defined in the example is generated by this phi. And this G here is a, this is a very interesting group. So this is a form of GM over the, the, the function field um, in, in, two, in two variables, C, F, X, Y. So what do I mean by this? When I say a form of GM over this field, I mean that this is an algebraic group defined over this field, such that if you look, if you take the algebraic closure, it becomes isomorphic to GM, the multiplicative group of the field. And so I would like to, um, <clears throat> so if you are interested in explicit equations, actually this is a sort of, a, um, um, a description of the group. Uh, but here, if you want to know what are the elements of the group, actually we can write down all the elements of this group. So in, for instance, in this G, so these are in terms of the coefficients of the hypersurface. So we can write down all the elements, uh, explicitly all the elements in this group. But in a, in a sense, I think it's nicer to, to describe it in this way. So I would like to, uh, for, for the remaining of the talk, uh, to give you a rough idea of what, what are the techniques that get into this, uh, this proof. So, so first of all, let me just uh, describe this, uh, this, uh, this basic diagram. So we have our hypersurface D, which uh, with one singular point at, uh, one singular point at P. And if we blow up, so this diagram, what I'm doing is I'm blowing up P3 at this point. So this I have already described this uh, similar blow up. So when we do this, we desingularize the, hyper, the hypersurface. Now, now the, the surface now becomes D tilde. So what I, when after blowing up, I get the smooth K3 surface. And actually we have to understand this K3 surface um, very well in order to, to, to prove our theorem. So we, we understand the skater surface, the, its corresponding lattice and so on. And notice that if you project from a point, we have a quartic surface and it has a singular point, a, a, a point of, uh, a singular point of multiplicity two at the point P. So when you project from this point, actually you, if you look at this, uh, this morphism to P2, if you restrict now to D tilde, you get a two to one, a double cover of P2. So this is uh, this, double, this double cover here. So now uh, from this basic diagram, now this is the main part of the proof of our theorem. So given any birational self map of P3 that preserves the volume form associated to D, we show that there is a uh, commutative diagram like this. So let me explain this. So we blow up the point. So here we look at the blow up. So of course, if we blow up the point, we can always get um, a psi tilde making the diagram commute. So this is always true. But here, see the, the important thing here is that this psi tilde is, um, is preserves this P1 bundle to, to P2. So in other words, what we have to show is that any birational self map of P3 that preserves this volume form has to preserve this star of lines through the point P. 
So this is not true in general for any uh, birational self-map of P3. This is far from being true. And this special types of birational self-maps are, are, are called uh, de jean -Pierre. So we have to prove that they preserve this star of lines. Now, once we, once one, and this is the main part of the proof, uh, to, and I will discuss this in, 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 in the, my next slide. So, uh, but once you have this, let's see what we get. So now if you want to understand the group of birational self-maps preserving, preserving D, what you have to do is to, in, is, uh, this is equivalent to understanding the birational self-maps of the blow-up X that fix the divisor, the, the, hyper, the, the, the hypersurface deep field up. And this hypersurface maps true to one uh, onto P2. So if we view our X, so this X is a P1 bundle over P2, whose function field is exactly CSXY. So if you view X as a model of P1 over C2, so over this P1, well, we have this hypersurface. So this is not really two points. Um, but after a base change, actually I can think instead of having one, um, one D tilde that double covers P2, after a base change, I get exactly two hypersurfaces, two sections. And then, a so what we want when we look view this as a, P, a P1 over, over the base, what we have is a birational self-map of P1 that either preserve, that preserve this set of two points. So it either switches them or fixes them uh, point-wise. So, and this is where we get this uh, exact sequence. So if you, you see what it does to these two points, whether it switches them or if it fixes them. So this is the map to the cyclic group of order two. Actually, and, the, and, the, and what we get here in the, in the kernel is precisely the birational self maps of P1 that preserve these two points. And the sequence splits exactly because that example that I gave you that is an involution and induces this, uh, this switching in the, in the sheets. Okay, so now this G is then uh, auto birational self maps of P1 that fix just two points. But birational self maps of P1 are just automorphisms of P1. And if they fix two points, they're just the multiplicative group. So this is how we get this description of G. And then from this description, we can actually write down precisely what is this P1 bundle and what are um, the, the, uh, the description of the. Um, of the elements. So this is the idea of the proof. So the main part of the proof is actually to get a commutative diagram that is here in, uh, in pink. And, and for that, I will, just, uh, this, I will just tell you what are the tools that we use uh, without too many details. So the idea is that we need a program for factorizing birational self maps of PN. And such program exists. So this is called the Sarkisov program. So this was developed in the context of the minimal model program. So in dimension three, it was proved by Corti in 1995. And in higher dimensions, this was done after the MMP by Haken and McKernan in, uh, um, later on in 2013. So this is the idea that if you have any, uh, if you're giving Psi a birational map between Pn, we would like to factorize it as, si as simple birational maps between uh, intermediate varieties. So, so this is what we have. So this Xi that appear in, this, in the decomposition, they are, we have to um, allow for other rational varieties, not necessarily P Pn. So what, ha what appears there in, as the nodes in this graph are what we call the Mori fiber spaces. So what are these? So in terms of the minimal model program, remember that I told you that in general, we do not have only one um, distinguished element in every birational class. We have a few. And, and the Xi's that are, can appear here are exactly um, the possible outcomes of the minimal model program for a rational uh, variety. So these are uh, what we call Mori fiber spaces. And the Psi I, I will not define in details, but they are elementary links. So they are very simple birational maps 
that we can that are easy very easy to describe for instance it could be just uh, the blow up of a point and and uh, but of course this is uh, this this is in general for any birational self map of pn and but what we have more recently uh, theorem by corti and and carlo giros is that um, this program actually goes through if you're for volume preserving map so a volume preserving by rational self map of pn with a given hypersurface d um, if this pair is log canonical or has mild singularities then um, this this birational map can be factorized as a composition of volume preserving circuits of the okay? this volume preserving something that uh, can be made more um, explicit um, but basically what it means is that we have um, we can we can attach to each one of these xi a meromorphic volume form such that these links are uh, volume preserving and um, so this is actually a, a very this is very strong of course if you have any birational map and you have uh, a volume form in one side we can get the corresponding volume form on the other side but in general it will pick up um, singularities that get out of the of the scope of the minimal model program so here we have to do a careful analysis of um, singularities and then we use this uh, we use this these tools to actually prove our our main results so um, so I hope I gave you uh, at least an idea of what get into this uh, type of problem. And so I will finish here. So I thank you for uh, attending the talk and a special thanks to Santiago Arango, Charles Stats and Wikipedia for some of the nice pictures. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much for such a nice talk. And are there any questions? You can either unmute yourself or write it in the chat. So I, I can start. So uh, I, I will ask uh, if there is a similar technique or, or there is some information about the group of, of birational morphism, for example, a final triple or higher dimensional final varieties. Yes, sure. I mean, this, this, um, so we, so th this is something that we, that we have just started. But of course, if you take any funnel variety with Picard number one, mm -hmm. so this is an example of a, a, a Mori fiber space. And we do have, let me just put this again. And we do have a Sarkis of program for such variety. So it makes sense if you want to look at other, any funnel variety of Picard number one, you will have uh, this decomposition theorem at your disposal. And then you just, have to look for some interesting uh, volume form and try to do the same thing. So this is uh, this. So we, I should say that it looked okay. It looks uh, something very easy, but it was actually it is. Uh, you, you have to understand in general very well the the hypersurface D, the, the geometry of these, is actually what governs what kind of link you can have. So. Um, so in so we we, we work this out for, you know for smooth for general for general hypersurface our techniques using this decomposition theorem we can actually uh, show that you don't get anything new so you cannot we show that the first link fails and then this was the first case that we looked at the case of um, quartic with one double point but of course now you can look at you know what if it has more points or if what if you, more singular points. And, and then in principle, this can be done, or you can do it for other ambient spaces as well. Nice, thank you so much. Are there any other questions? So Claudio says that he would like to see the main theorem again. Ah, theorem, uh, theorem B, Let's, uh, this one? So I let Claudio ask. Sorry, I, for some reason I cannot see the, the chat. No, I guess he sent the he sent the oh, question. I, can can mm -hmm. I, I? I just wanted to ask you. I mean, up to which point this theorem now? I mean, I wanted to check the statements because I didn't know if it makes sense to ask whether. Uh, so, up to which point the, the knowing the the group of birational transformation determines d. 
I mean, um, so we have not thought about this from this uh, point of view, but this is certainly this is certainly uh, an interesting question. So, for instance, let me just put back the theorem A. So, um, in general, if you take something very general, you don't expect you don't expect to, to have uh, anything in this group. So, so it will it may it will not determine D, but it 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 probably tells you something about D. But we have not we have not thought about this uh, about from this 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 converse question. But because sorry, okay, uh, let me disclose my ignorance. But I I seem to re remember something like typically, or at least for for very high degree, you expect the automorphism of P n comma d to be trivial, no? Trivial, yes, correct. So okay. this is why I'm saying that it will not recover the d, for instance. Yeah. If any d very general, will will give you the same thing here. So it will not recover. It will not recover the d, but maybe. It does tell you something about D. That uh, so, for instance, there, there is another direction that one could look at. Is uh, I wrote here what I mean by very general. So D smooth and um, and the the Lefschetz theorem uh, holds. But there has also Ogizo has been uh, looking from a different perspective. But he has been looking at K three surfaces, um, quartic uh, smooth quartic surfaces in P three for which uh, this is not true. And they do have interesting, very interesting automorphism groups. So he constructed an example, for instance, of uh, when this automorphism group is, um, is a free group generated by three elements. And, uh, and so this, this is just describing this part here. But I believe that in those cases, this part here is much bigger and it would also be interesting to to understand what is the the, the group of birational self maps of P three preserving that quartic. So there is a lot of things to do in this direction. So this is uh, something that, uh, an area that is sort of wide wide open. Thank you. If not, we again. I have, I have a question if you don't mind. Also, somebody in the chat raised their hand, I can't remember, or in the thingy. But I have a question if you don't mind. Um, so in the, um, in, the barational, in, the, in the group, you get a Z mod 2Z uh, as mm -hmm. a factor. And the, 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 the surface is, is the surface the same thing as the sort of um, the Z mod 2Z singularity in the ADE classification? Yeah, so this is an A1 singularity. Yes. In general, so it's going to be an A1 singularity, but it has nothing to do with that, I think. So this is just, this is just a corresponding, this, this part here is corresponding to the fact that um, this, uh, if you project from the point, then you have, th this corresponds to the fact that the birational self group, the birational group of D is excel at this Z mod 2 Z. Mm -hmm because this is just uh, given by the involution induced by the projection from the point P. Okay, so it doesn't have anything, I, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't expect Z mod NZ in an A n AN minus one singularity. Um, um, no, okay. I don't think so. No, 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 if in the case, okay, in the case, so we are working out as a slightly more degenerate case, and this is uh, this is almost finished, but not finished yet, which is the case of an A two singularity. And you still, it seems that you still get this Z mod two Z here. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? So thank you so much. And we, I would like to announce you that the next week on Thursday, we have again the Math Associate Seminar and he is going to talk uh, Camilo Arias about from Colombia, from Unal Medellin. So you're welcome to attend to the next week. And thank you everyone to attend our seminar. <laughs>